Well, hey. Look, thank you for that. Um, and look, it's, it's actually lovely to be here. I, I was at something last week, and this, this thing today and the thing last week, I, in both those things, I felt like I, I feel like I'm among my people. Uh, people who, you know, people who are passionate about ending men's violence against women, people who do work focused on social justice, people who are smart and interesting and funny and gorgeous. So I feel like I'm very much among <laughs> my people. Um, and the people I was among last week were a thousand people in Delhi for the second uh, Men Engage Global Symposium on engaging men and boys in building gender justice. So Global Symposium, India, Men and Boys, Gender Justice. Thousand people, 94 countries, and Men's Violence Against Women was a very significant focus of their activity. And it was an incredibly exciting uh, event, actually. Um, but as with many uh, of these kinds of things, um, there were people there with colds. And clearly, I must have shaken the wrong hand. So I came home with a cold. My son has a cold. He's up the back of the room. And I had a real dilemma this morning. Do I cancel, stay home, not come to this thing at all? Or do I drag him up to Sydney on the train, which left, uh, left at about 7 o'clock? Um, so I've done that. I've gone with the latter, the bad parent option. Um, but I don't want to stretch the bad parenting too far. And so, in fact, I am going to take him home after this. Um, and so I'm really actually grumpy and disappointed that I won't get to hang out with you and chat to you and so on um, for the rest of the day. And I do apologise for that. For me, that, that feels like a really significant missed opportunity. And again, I'm sorry. Um, but certainly, you know, I won't be going away from this field. And in fact, some of you may know that the ARC, the Australia Research Council, awarded me a four-year research project to do work. It's good. Uh, to do work on engaging men in violence prevention. And so starting in January, I won't be marking essays anymore. I'll be doing research on the role that men and boys can play in prevention and doing four substantial case studies based in Australia. Um, and so this will be my bread and butter work and I'm thrilled by that. So, um, and the other thing I noticed about this work is if you're a man in this work, you have to be called Michael. So there's Michael Salter, uh, there's me internationally, there's Michael Kimmel, Michael Kaufman, there's a few others. So um, anyway, although in fact at this symposium, I was inspired by work of people with different names, people with names like Raj or Sravistava or other kinds of names. And in fact, some of the best work in this field is going on uh, in countries outside the West. So one of the things Michael asked me to do was to give a quick introduction to prevention. And looking around the room, I think you know this stuff a whole lot better than me. But let's, let's run through some quick basics. So in this field, the notion of primary prevention has very much come to the fore, the notion that not only should we respond to victims and survivors, not only should we hold perpetrators accountable, um, but we should work to prevent men's violence against women from occurring in the first place. We must address its underlying causes and change the social conditions that feed into violence. And really that's only become possible because of the work of people in this room and others around the country, because of survivors and advocates and professionals and so on. And while there are tensions in some ways between different kinds of prevention work, uh, there's certainly, I think, a kind of a fair consensus that primary prevention work should complement and certainly not take away from uh, work with victims and survivors and perpetrators. I've given you a very quick account there of kind of three notions of prevention, and really I'm focused on primary prevention, on efforts to stop initial perpetration by men or boys. Um, but I'm conscious that in working with any group of men or boys, there'll be men in the room who are already using violence. There'll be victims in the room. There'll be men who've also experienced violence, often at the hands of other, whip, other, other men. And so, you know, these categories themselves are blurry. Um, but as I've said, they all contribute to each other. And so in terms of what it is we're trying to do, what it is we're trying to change, um, there's very much a sense these days that we have to work across society. We have to work across different levels of society. And we have to do that because violence against women and girls is rooted in gender inequalities, in, sort of, in systemic and structural inequalities of power that take place in individual relationships and families, that take place in communities, and that take place in society overall. So we need multi-level strategies. And some of you will have seen the kind of WHO ecological model that emphasises the need to address different levels of the social order. I'm going to run through some strategies that are relevant at, that different, at those different levels of the social order, but I'm going, to, I'm going to keep it fairly short, partly because this draws in part on a piece that's coming out in The Lancet. The Lancet is a big deal medical journal. Um, on November 27th, I think it is, it's releasing a special issue on violence against women and girls, five articles. And some of this is drawn from an article by um, Michau, I think, M-I-C-H-A-U. I also have a piece in there with some colleagues on the engaging men part of this work. So I'll keep this short because I am drawing on a special issue of The Lancet, which will be out soon. 
Um, this diagram's not from The Lancet, and it'd be hard for some of you to see, but this diagram is flagging the ways in which gender inequalities at multiple levels of society are significant, at the level of individual personality and the ways in which men learn to feel entitled and dominant, and women learn to feel um, subservient and to kind of bend over backwards to meet men's needs, at the level of communities in terms of stigma and shame and um, unequal gender roles at the level of social norms and practices and the ways in which violence becomes normalised and tolerated, and then at the level of law and society. Um, in fact, this blown up version shows you some of the gender inequalities, the dynamics of gender inequality that feed into violence against women and girls, and then this blown up version of the bottom half shows the inverse of those. And really, this is the task we've set ourselves. The task we've set ourselves, um, you know, make no mistake, is to change society, to to rid ourselves of systemic gender inequalities and to build that gender equal society. Because all the evidence is that it's that more than anything that will end men's violence against women and girls. So to run through some examples, and starting big, let's start macro. We know that law and policy make a difference. Now they've often been tools of tertiary prevention. Um, but in fact, uh, they're also important tools of primary prevention. And there's some really interesting research showing that around the world, the factor that makes the most difference on whether a country has good laws and policies is the existence of a women's movement. Uh, thank you feminism, in other words. It's feminism, it's women's movements that have really, that make a difference to law and policy around the world. Law and policy also shape what communities think. In countries with weak justice systems, in countries with weak or absent domestic violence laws, there's also a greater tolerance for domestic violence. Law can send a message, in other words. And law and policy are crucial in getting prevention strategies in place, whether that's school curricula, or alcohol regulation, or gun violence regulation, or shaping the content of pornography, or other strategies. Um, and uh, funnily enough, uh, in some of the international documents I've read, it's actually Australia that's held up as a good example of national prevention planning. Now, you may have mixed feelings or deep hostility or who knows about Australia's national plans to reduce violence against women and their children, but internationally, at least, we're seen as leading some of this work in terms of kind of multi-level action being mandated by a national government. And in fact, there's a good example that put money into this and you make a difference. There was a, a US study across jurisdictions over 96 to 2002. Jurisdiction, jurisdictions with violence against women grants in the US had lower rates of assaults after that period than jurisdictions without violence against women grants. Um, and so funding makes a difference. But if we think globally, and, I'm, and I sort of, I really was pushed last week to think globally, um, you know, to think globally about Economic, about economic and political inequalities, about the situations in which communities find themselves in different countries and so on. And countries that have weak states, countries that have weak governments, or indeed countries that have uh, governments that are hell-bent on subduing or oppressing their populations, clearly have different kinds of challenges in terms of law and policy. So at the community level, we're talking about inequitable norms and practices. And we know that communities make a difference. I've often done the kind of thought exercise where you're trying to set up your daughter, your 20-year-old daughter or your 20-year-old female friend uh, with a male partner. There's a thousand men in the room next door. Which one of those guys is going to be the kind of best boyfriend for her? In particular, which one of those guys is least likely to sexually assault or coerce her? Now, one thing we'd want to know about each of those guys is who are their friends? Who are their mates? What's their work context? What's their sporting context? Because communities make a difference. Males are more likely to sexually assault if they live in contexts, uh, live or work in contexts which are male dominated, which are gender segregated, which involve sexist social norms and so on. So communities make a difference. And in doing this work, of course, we need to understand particular contexts. Whether you're working with, say, young indigenous men in Queensland, or whether you're working with you know, middle class, middle aged white guys in Melbourne, in either case, you need to know something about culture, about the specific forms of culture and language and gender and sexuality, which structure those, structure those contexts. Of course, in this work, we also have to support, um, support survivors, um, support survivors and challenge those who are using violence to, to um, be held accountable. Just to give an example, I'll give some scattered examples through here, and I'll try to focus mainly on international examples. There's a TV series um, in Nicaragua called, I think it's Puntos de Ensuentro, en en and um, it's, a, it's a telenovela, uses a kind of soap opera style, but uh, matches that with community-based events, with community-based events, with talks in high schools, with other kinds of community participation to generate dialogue um, and to shift community norms in that context. 
interpersonal level, we know that uh, what your friends think, how your family respond, um, your peers and so on, are a significant influence on your own practices and behaviours. Again, those thousand men in the room next door, knowing something about the extent to which their male peers also use violence or tolerate violence is significant. Um, and so people have done strategies, uh, people have focused on strategies engaging families, engaging peers, engaging those around you in shifting discriminatory value systems and so on. And uh, there are examples uh, which mobilise young people in kind of critical discussion, critical discussion among groups of young people about, um, about relationships, about sex and so on. One of the most well doc documented examples is one there called Safe Dates. Uh, Safe Dates is one of the few uh, schools based programs that has a very good evidence base. Another program um, that also has a good evidence base um, is Healthy Relationships, a Canadian program. And one thing you notice about these two programs is these are lengthy programs. Um, I think one of them is 20 plus hours long, the other one is 50 plus hours long. <laughs> it's unlikely that your one hour program will make much difference to the attitudes and behaviours associated with violence. Um, skipping some other examples, there's, there's some interest in what people call gender synchronised work, where you work with men and women together, where you bring them together, you have them separately, then you bring them together and so on, and where you're trying to kind of increase the synergistic effect of your work by working with both women and men. Um, and there's a valuable example of that from South Africa, a program called Stepping Stones, um, which engages both women and men in building relationship skills, in building non-violence and so on. It used a cluster randomised trial looking at villages where the program was implemented and villages where the program was not and found significant differences in men's perpetration of sexual and non-sexual violence over a two year period. And that's kind of raising the bar, if you like, for evaluation. It's a bit beyond um, you know, running a one-off workshop and handing out, ha handing out worksheets that said, did you enjoy the workshop? Instead, it's actually, it's got a control or comparison group who didn't go through the intervention. You're following them in the long term, two years. You're not just asking about attitudes, you're asking about perpetration and so on. And Stepping Stones is one example that does show effectiveness using this kind of um, substantial strategy. There are also efforts that address other forms of violence against women and girls. I've got Tostan up there. Tostan is a strategy focused on female genital mutilation or circumcision and also child marriage. And again, it's a community education approach that, that engages villagers in discussion and in taking action in local communities. Um, and again, a quasi-experimental evaluation in Senegal, in Africa, found that women in the intervention villages reported less violence, reported significantly less violence in the last 12 months than women in the non-intervention, the comparison villages. Finally, there's the individual level. There's, the ways, there's ways in which we need to mobilise individual women and men to be agents of change. And I've spent a lot of time uh, writing and thinking and working on the ways in which men can be mobilised as, as agents of change in their own lives, among the men around them, and so on. One popular version of this strategy is bystander intervention. Now, oddly enough, while bystander intervention is popular and becoming popular in Australia too, um, the actual empirical evidence for its effectiveness is pretty weak. There are sort of three or so decent experimental or quasi-experimental evaluations that exist in the world. Um, they show a positive impact on attitudes, but a much more equivocal, a much more uneven impact on behaviours. So bystander intervention may not quite be the magic bullet that some of us think it is. Um, the example I've given there is an Indian example, though, called um, Bell Bajau, which means ring the bell. And that was, this was a multimedia campaign that involved a um, social marketing, social marketing campaign. It reached 130 million people, which in India is not very many, but anyway, 130 million people. Um, and also involved, uh, so multimedia, television, um, television, radio and print, and also community mobilisation, community workshops, vans, leadership initiatives, and so on. Uh, what else? What else? Uh, two other dimensions of this work. Work with victims and survivors that some of you may do and work with perpetrators. There's a whole bunch of research now on the impact of the kind of work done in refuges and domestic violence shelters and so on. And it does show um, positive impacts on anxiety, on stress and other kinds of forms of mis uh, physical and mental ill health. It doesn't necessarily show declines in victimisation um, and I think you know, there are understandable reasons for that. The work with perpetrators or batterers on the other hand is actually not very encouraging at all. At all, again, work with perpetrators is encourage uh, is you know is popular. There are 18 or so studies that did a kind of quasi-experimental or experimental design, and they weren't very encouraging. 
in fact. Um, so a recent review of those 18 studies uh, found that only two showed significant declines in perpetration. Other studies do, but you've got a real problem of dropout, that the men who stay in the program are motivated to change and do show declines in violence, and the men who aren't motivated to change drop out, and then if you look at them, well, surprise, surprise, you know, their levels of violence have continued. So you've got kind of methodological problems in how you do this. Final strategy I mentioned before I get back to engaging men and boys, economic empowerment. So globally, um, gender inequalities are the most critical factor shaping men's violence against women, and one dimension of that is women's dependence on men. And so in some countries, there's a growing emphasis on economic empowerment. In other words, let's shift gender inequalities um, you know, to, to build women's empowerment and thus to lessen the vulnerability to violence. There's a good study um, called IMAGE in South Africa, Tanzania, and Peru. Um, it involved microfinance, kind of economic empowerment strategies among women, skills, being, skills building, participatory training, and so on. Two years of programming found a 55% year, uh, sorry, 55 reduction in women's reports of physical or sexual partner violence. And it's now being scaled up, scaled up to other countries. So economic empowerment internationally is emerging as a significant strategy. So there's a whole lot of work going on. In fact, I'm kind of sick of reviews of this field. Um, you know, various international development agencies have commissioned reviews, um, DFID, the UK agency, USAID, the US agency, a whole bunch of other organisations. Really, we don't need to keep asking, is there evidence that this stuff works? Because I can just give you half a foot of paper that shows the strategies that work. Um, and certainly it's clear that there's no one magic bullet. There's no one strategy that is the most appropriate strategy in all contexts. But there are some obvious kinds of lessons. And this, this comes out of that Lancet piece that will be due out um, next week. And so these are the, you know, and you'll be familiar with this. We know that there are some strategies that simply don't work. Strategies of blame and shame. Strategies just of sort of one-off advertising campaigns. Strategies which consider violence against women in isolation from other forms of social uh, injustice and that neglect other forms of violence and so on. We know a little bit more about what works and what doesn't. Okay, let's get on to involving men and boys in prevention. I said that primary prevention has become a significant focus. Part of that is a significant focus on engaging men and boys in this work. Um, and I've mentioned the, the Men Engage Global Symposium as an example of that. And there's kind of a well-established well -established rationale, rationale for engaging men and boys. In fact, because I imagine it's familiar to you, I won't go through that rationale. I and others have also been starting to raise critical questions about this focus on men and boys. And in fact, there was a really fascinating discussion at the Global Symposium about some of the tricky issues, the political issues involved in this work, about accountability, for example, or about the ways in which work with men is coming to be seen as a goal in itself rather than as a means to a goal. The ways in which work with men is um, an emphasis on work with men is diminishing the legitimacy of work with women and women focused and women only programs. And so there are some troubling issues here. Um, and in fact, um, the very last slide um, here um, mentions a piece that I've submitted to Culture, Health and Sexuality, another international journal, uh, which is a critical assessment of efforts to engage men and boys in prevention. I've been a cheerleader for this work. I've been saying, rah, 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 let's engage men, this stuff works. In this piece, I say, um, actually, there are some issues, there are some dangers, there are some problems. And so um, it's an interesting counter to some of that work. Um, but. Um, so this is a quick example, this is a quick diagram from the Lancet piece that I've co-authored with Rachel Jukes and James Lang, and it shows again the kind of variety of strategies, the variety of strategies that are being adopted at different levels of the social order to engage men and boys in prevention, from social marketing to bystander intervention to, you know, other kinds of strategies. And in fact, there have been some interesting shifts. There have been some interesting shifts in this field in terms of how men are seen. So when violence prevention kind of began in Australia and elsewhere, men were absent from that, um, seen very much as the problem, seen only as perpetrators. Um, there was a growing shift in the late 80s, early 90s to the notion of men as allies, as men as having a potential positive role to play. Um, increasingly, there's an emphasis on gender relations and the kind of complex webs of relations between women and men. And indeed, uh, more recently, a shift towards recognition of the structured and unequal character of those relations. Now, it's not that this is a homogenous and uniform shift across the field. There are tensions between different ways of articulating men's, men's and boys' roles in prevention. 
But certainly one of the things I noticed at the Delhi Global Symposium, which had only, was only just starting to emerge in the Rio Global Symposium in 2009, is a growing emphasis on the diversities of men's lives and the fact of men's victimisation as well as men's perpetration. And when I talk about men's victimisation, I'm not, I'm not uh, channeling one in three in the kind of crappy anti-feminist backlash that you've all been subjected to. Instead, I'm talking about other forms of violence, typically forms of violence perpetrated by men against other men, and also forms of collective and state violence, the large numbers of men and boys who are killed or maimed or tortured uh, in, the, in the situations of conflict and post-conflict. And again, globally, these are things we have to be acutely aware of. So there are sort of complex and I think valuable shifts in how we understand men's and boys' roles. There are some trends. So there's now an international network called Men Engage. Men Engage is, is an international network of over 400 NGOs um, who work to address a variety of issues to do with men and boys and gender injustice. Um, there's also increasing diversity in the, strat in the kind of domains through which we engage men and boys in prevention. So for example, fathering is now on the agenda. The Men Care campaign, which is again a global and a very interesting campaign, Men Care is a campaign focused on men's involvements with their children, but a key agenda of that campaign is that by increasing men's gender equitable relations with their female partners or ex-partners and with their children, we will also increase fathers' non-violence. And so it very much has an agenda to do with violence prevention, but focused on parenting. This also work with men in different settings, um, settings of conflict and post-conflict, as, as I've said. There's an increasing orientation towards looking at structures, looking at the material inequalities um, which structure men's and women's lives. There's an increased engagement in policy. So for example, SONKE, S-O-N-K-E, SONKE Gender Justice in South Africa has been really working hard to push its government to hold itself accountable, to be held accountable for domestic violence laws and policies. Um, Campaigns by Sonka Gender Justice or by um, other organisations like the Institute for Development Studies based in London really push governments, push governments to adopt domestic violence laws and policies, to build capacity and expertise, um, to address human rights abuses and so on. So there's some interesting work going on here that's focusing on policy. And of course, as with this field in general, there's a growing emphasis on evaluation, a growing emphasis on the need to, to collect data, to collect evidence about the effectiveness of our work. Um, in that Lancet piece, we talked briefly about gender theory, about the kind of well-established theory regarding the social construction of masculinities, drawing on Raywin Connell's work, Raywin who's based here in Sydney and is a kind of, I suppose, the preeminent masculinity theorist and other masculinity theorists as well. Uh, and really we're drawing on gender theory, on feminist theory. And talking briefly, we talked briefly in the paper about the implications of that work for work with men. You know, things like acknowledging diversities in men's lives, acknowledging the gap between ideals of masculinity and men's actual performance of those ideals and so on. But there are some challenges. And the paper I gave in Delhi last week was focused on this, was really saying there are dangers. Um, there are, you know, feminists for a long time have had concern about this field, some disquiet, some concern about the kind of growing emphasis on engaging men and boys, and there are some good reasons to be concerned. And I'll run through a few of those. One of the problems is that much of this work is, complex, is conceptually simplistic. So much of this work doesn't involve a decent theory of change. It doesn't really identify the kinds of predictors or causal factors or antecedents of violence, um, of violence perpetration or victimisation, and its actual activities may not address them or may not actually shift them. And so it kind of falls well short of best practice. Um, there's a neglect uh, of, there's often a treatment of men and boys as a kind of homogenous group, as if men and boys all have the same relationships to violence. We neglect the kind of feminist intersectionality 101, and feminism takes for granted these days that women's lives and men's lives are shaped not only by gender, but also by race, by class, by ethnicity, and so on. In, in other words, by multiple forms of advantage and, um, and disadvantage. And indeed, how we treat male perpetrators, how male perpetrators are treated, whether or not women are believed, is structured by race and ethnicity and other factors as much as, as it is by gender. Um, there's also been, uh, in this field typically, there's a treatment of men as heterosexual. There's the assumption that men should come to this issue because of the women in their own lives. Some of them don't have women in their own lives, or if they do, they're not very really attracted to them. Um, and there's kind of been a, a neglect of gay and bisexual men, and also of transgender men, whereas that too was, I think, very much on focus um, in the Indian context, where you've got significant transgender communities. There's also a treatment of violence itself as homogenous. 
this field, or certainly the work with men and boys, hasn't caught up, I think, with what's a growing debate um, in uh, violence against women advocacy and scholarship about diverse forms of violence, particularly diverse forms of violence in couple relationships. Um, and that too can mean we misdiagnose what we're addressing and we misdiagnose the kinds of solutions that are relevant. One thing that's pervasive in this field is a focus on attitudes. It's kind of remarkable how much we still focus just on attitudes, as if attitudes were the key thing we need to change and not only, and not just one dimension of the factors which shape perpetration. And you see this over and over. You see this, in fact, even in our watch materials, where you know, there's an acknowledgement of the need to address structural gender inequalities, and in the very next sentence, there's a sentence which implies that the focus should be only or primarily on attitudes. I think that's a kind of a, um, a kind of routine focus on attitudes which is profoundly um, misleading and limiting. Okay, a few other challenges. There are some political dangers. There's definitely some political dangers in this field. I think that to some extent a focus on men and boys has actually weakened the legitimacy of efforts focused on women and girls. It's not taken away funding as far as I can tell except in some um, kind of meta sense of there being a pie and you know spending on one thing is not spending on another but I don't think there's been direct um, taking over of funding. Some people have been concerned about men taking over this work. My concern is more they don't turn up, they're just absent, um, don't do the work at all. Um, or that oddly when men do the work they ride the glass escalator. They kind of, they get status and privilege and uh, leadership out of, out of proportion to their efforts um, like men in other feminised professions, like men in nursing and teaching and so on, it's the glass es escalator. There's some problematic framings in this field too. One is a kind of constant focus on masculinity, as if what have we got to change? We've got to change masculinity. And there's a sense in which that's true. We have to change the social meanings and practices associated with being a man. But it can mean that we kind of forget a focus on actual men and men's actual practices and identities. And we see sexism and violence as a problem of some kind of free floating thing out there rather than a problem of um, men and how men behave. Another kind of comforting framing for some of us, um, for some people in this field, is a notion of two sorts of men. There's the kind of well-meaning men, the men of conscience, and then there's those other men, those bad men. And some of you may have read that extraordinary piece by Tom Ma in The Age last year, where he talked about the monster myth and his kind of disturbing realisation that the men who do violence, like the, um, like the man who fatally assaulted his partner, um, the men who do violence are normal men. They're the men who live and work amongst us um, and so on. And so a kind of breaking down of that two types of men is valuable. And certainly that notion of two types of men can involve a focus just on the extreme forms of violence. I've never given a woman a black eye. I've never held a knife to a woman's throat. Oh sure, I've coerced my female partner into sex by guilt tripping her. I've you know, called her names or policed her weight or limited her to contact with friends, but I've definitely never been violent. You know, that kind of problematic framing. Um, there's some other issues too. Certainly in this work there's a routine appeal to real men, a kind of notion that you know, we should say real men don't use violence. Um, so the graphic there is from a CFMEU campaign. Um, you know, good on the CFMEU for addressing this issue. But an appeal to real men can be problematic because it's real men who sometimes are those men who are most likely to use violence. Um, and men's investment in being men and being real men can very much feed into perpetration or tolerance for perpetration. The, the use of real men, the use of male sporting heroes, of male public figures, for example in the He for She campaign, just released by the UN, that sometimes involves the notion that real men, that hegemonic men, are bell cows. They kind of wear the bow, sorry, wear the bell, and other men will follow. Other men will follow these real men into you know, violence prevention work. But again, and you know, I think if it works, it works. I'm pragmatic about this. But I also think that we have to be careful because men's violence against, uh, against women and indeed against other men is sustained in part by rigid gender codes. It's sustained by rigid gender codes, by the policing of manhood, by notions of real men. And I think there's places where we should also affirm other forms of manhood and gender. We should affirm sissy men and girly men and gay men and transgender men and so on. And we should turn up the volume. We should turn up the volume on the actual diversity among men, including among heterosexual men. Okay, some further challenges. We actually don't know a whole lot about what works. Um, and you know, I'm, uh, I think that the evidence base is growing and indeed the report that's being launched today is a great example of building that evidence base. But we need to know more about what works and what doesn't. 
Um, and so, you know, most of the work with men and boys hasn't been evaluated or it's been evaluated poorly. And there's a whole lot of questions that remain. There's certainly some things we know are more effective. But for example, there's issues around which men this program was effective with. Um, some studies show that the most sexually coercive men, for example, change less, don't change at all, in fact, than, than other men in some, in some programs. We don't know about the mediators of change necessarily. We don't know what sustains men's commitment um, to this work. We don't know much about the wider features of communities and the wider features of organisations that shape men's participation. And certainly one of the case studies I'd, I plan to do is a case study of men who take up public advocacy, of men who become advocates on behalf of violence prevention efforts like the White Ribbon Campaign, looking at what shapes those efforts, um, what sustains those efforts, um, what challenges those efforts and so on. We don't know a lot about uh, kind of culturally appropriate and culturally relevant interventions and so on. So there's a whole lot of questions we don't know. And globally, at least, from uh, study li studies like the Images study, there's some evidence that men's perpetration is shaped by victimisation. And I'm wary of saying this because it can feed into simplistic claims about intergenerational transmission, a kind of diminishing responsibility. Why are men violent? Oh, because they were subject to violence themselves. That's too simple. That's misleading. But there are relationships between victimisation and perpetration in complex ways. And so we need to somehow uh, pay attention to those. So some final points. Um, I'm getting more and more blocked up the more I speak. Um, so we certainly need multi-level, multi-faceted programming. All the evidence is from violence prevention work in general and from work with men in particular that that kind of multi-level um, comprehensive strategy will be more effective than other kinds of strategies. And unfortunately that takes money, that takes political will. I, I don't mean by this that every intervention, every organisation should work at every level of the social order, but we do need partnerships and collaboration. And I was encouraged to see that many of the uh, organisations that work with men and boys internationally are women's and violence prevention organisations or are working with those women's and violence prevention organisations. Um, I've said that feminist and women's movements must be uh, engaged, and that's because they're central actors, central actors in this work, in putting forward models of engagement, in considering new forms of violence, in drawing attention to violence against particular groups of women or men, and so on. So their active presence, their expertise is critical. And so that means a strong women's sector. Um, I'm sorry that Peru's not in the room. It does mean a strong women's sector and strong feminist policy machinery. Um, and look, you know, the sort of final point really I want to make is that, that to shift violence against women, as I said at the very start, we will have to transform wider gender inequalities, economic, political, cultural, material inequalities between women and men. I'll leave it there. Thanks.